And now it's time for Power of Prophecy with your host, former professor at the University of Texas at Austin, career United States Air Force officer, and best-selling author, Tex Mars. Hello, friends. This is Tex Mars, and welcome to another edition of Power of Prophecy. Well, today we're going to be looking at, I'm telling you, a, a, a topic so mighty, so incredibly important. You've got to say, keep right by that dial. You don't want the, someone to accidentally touch it <laughs> or move it. If you listen to the tape, you just get your chair and pull it up close and get everything away from you that would distract you. And listen very closely today, because I'm going to tell you how to totally cast out fear in your life. No matter what's happening to you, no matter your current circumstances, whatever is troubling you, whatever has befallen you, whatever you think may happen to you, I'm going to tell you how you can be freed you you can you can be <laughs> another another man you you can be become a new creature i mean you can totally have confidence in your future the title of this talk today is only believe only believe you know there's so many bible stories that talk about fear and people trembling and so many people worried about what's happening in the world and it, it, listen this world is a wicked place wars and rumors of wars constantly diseases plagues we've all got enough to worry about don't we whether we're going to have a job tomorrow whether the stock market's going to fizzle out and we're all going to be broken. Uh, our retirement may be gone and we don't have enough money for food. And who, who knows what's going to happen to you and I in the world? Are, are you going to be able to even get by? I mean, you got a family. You can certainly have your, your wife or your husband. you got yourself. What are you going to do? I mean, I was flipping channels the other night. And there was this old police show on. I don't watch it much, but it sort of a, a the, the, the music sort of grabbed me a little bit. It was about the it was a, a police you know about the police. It was I guess real life police. And <laughs> the voice said, "Bad boys, bad boys, what you gonna do? What you gonna do when they come for you, bad boys?" <laughs> And I thought about that. Bad boys, what what you going to do when they come for you? Well, sometimes they come for the good boys and girls, don't they? They do. Well, what are you going to do, friends? Can you have confidence? Do you have enough strength in yourself? You know, many, many years ago in this ministry, people, they, well, they still ask me, they said, Tex, why is it you haven't been arrested? Why aren't you in prison? Why haven't you been killed? I mean, the topics you covered and the people, I mean, you know, you're so, boy, so despised by so many for just telling the truth. What are you going to do? <laughs> well, I'm going to keep telling the truth. Therein, my friends, is my protection, you see. I know of so many people, I'm not going to name their names because some of these people I love very dearly. They, 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 they're what you might call conspiracy theorists. I call them conspiracy scientists, of course. And they're, they're dead now. Their ministries have passed away. Some of them committed suicide, the authorities say. But did they? But, but somehow or other, they, they, they got all wrapped around what was happening and 
They vanished from the scene. I could name dozens of people that had ministries and that they're no longer around. You know many of these folks. But we're here, we're here every day, seven days a week, doing what we're doing. We have no fear. And it's not because I'm brave. Oh, I'm not so brave at all. It's not because I'm the Iron Man. I'm one of these superheroes. No, sir. <laughs> not me. I'm a little bit old, a little bit overweight, quite a bit fragile. I don't think I can last two minutes in a fist fight with anybody. I'm, I'm just, I'm, well, let's just say I'm past 70 years of age. <laughs> I don't, I don't think I could go like I used to when I was in the, my twenties. I felt like I was Superman back then. Well, I don't feel that way anymore, but, but you know, I still know something. Whatever happens to me in this world, I have, well, a bodyguard. <laughs> Man, he's big. He's strong. He's tall. He's muscular and he uses supernatural powers. Now he is a superhero <laughs> and I call him Jesus <laughs> and he's never failed me. I had a man call me some years ago. He was an author, a well-known author, published a number of books and we got to talking and he said, I, I, I'm, Tex, I'm not a Christian. I, I said, well, you could be, you know, and God would like you to be a Christian. And he said, no, he said, and, and then he said, very, very sadly. And I felt so sorry for him. He said, you know, I've tried to, to, to turn to God and obey God, but, but God hates me. I said, no, no, God doesn't hate you. <laughs> Where did you get that? God hates you. He said, I'm telling you, no matter what I do, when I try to be a good Christian, when I try to be a Christian, that's what he said. I've tried before. I've, I've tried to pray, but it doesn't work. I've tried to read the Bible, but I can't. There's some kind of a roadblock. God hates me. I said, no, God doesn't hate you. And I chatted with him another 30, 40 minutes or so, and I assured him God didn't hate him. God loved him. God wanted him to be in his kingdom. He said, I wish that were so, Tex, but I, I just know it. He says, when, whenever I, I try to get close to God, everything goes bad. My books don't sell or I'm not, I'm disinvited to some place and it seems like I'm punished when I try to become a Christian. I said, well, th there you go. That's, that's, that, it's working. The devil's after you. That, that's understandable. When, when you turn to God, the, the devil says, well, this is my last chance to get him or her. My last chance. I better get in there with all my, my strength and energy and all my reinforcements. Try to turn that gentleman. Try to turn him around from God. As that's what's happening. But you just persevere. Ask God's help. And he just sighed. He was determined that he, God hated him. He was just determined and it wasn't long till a phone call came into our ministry and they said that he was dead. He'd been found dead, shot. He killed himself. He committed suicide. He said God didn't love him. God hated him. And he killed himself. Now, folks. I don't know your circumstances, but I'm here to tell you that poor man was wrong. You need two words in your life. Just two words. Only believe. Only believe. Now we're going to talk about the Bible today. This could be the most important talk that we've ever had. You and I were friends, aren't we? 
you know, we're, we're friends. I, I feel we're friends. We've, we've been around this ministry for well over 30 years and some of you have stuck with us that long. Some of you just found out about us here. But, you know, we're friends, aren't we? Aren't you my friend? I think you are. I can share with you. I'd love to hear back from you, by the way. It, it may inspire me. It may encourage me. Now, I'm not going to kill myself if you don't write me. I'm, I'm telling you, but <laughs> I'm not going to kill myself because I, I do believe. I don't have any reason. I, I have reason to, to go forward. I'm being victorious. I, I'm, I'm a victor. I've got strength. I've got special strength. I'll tell you about it <laughs> here pretty quick. But I want to, I want to take you to the Bible to Mark chapter five, verse 22. It seems that Jesus was preparing to preach or preaching one day. And we read, and behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue. Ooh. One of the rulers of the synagogue. Jairus by name. And when he saw him, that is, he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. This is important, folks. This is a religious man. And when he saw Jesus, something Inside him said, this is, <laughs> you better, <laughs> you better fall at your feet and worship him. Can you imagine one of the rulers of the synagogue? 23 says, and besought him greatly saying, my little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her that she may be healed and she shall live. Now, let's think about that man's circumstances. His, his daughter was very sick. I don't know what disease she had. She was very ill. She, she was going to die. In any moment, she was going to die. This guy must have been desperate. I'm sure he had been at the synagogue. He was one of the rulers. And he had heard all the people there say, oh, that Jesus is a fake. That Jesus, he's a false messiah. That Jesus, he ought to be crucified. That Jesus, he's a, he's this and that and this and that. But when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. Hmm. And he asked Jesus to lay his hands, to come to his house and lay your hands on my daughter and she shall live. He didn't say, maybe she'll live, or I want to see if you can save her, or at least come and pray for her, or maybe come and visit us and comfort us during her funeral. He said, if you'll come and lay hands on her, she shall live. Only believe, my friends. And Jesus went with him. And much people followed him and thronged him. Jesus went with him. But there were a lot of people there, and, and he had other people pressing him. In fact, there was a woman there that pressed him, and and he had the, the crowd was so big that he he could he didn't even know who w had touched his garment. As he walked by, some woman reached up and touched his garment. He was on his way to this little girl. The, the man, the Jairus, the, the, the ruler of the synagogue, the leader of the synagogue had said, I know she'll live if you'll just come and, come and be with her, touch her, lay your hands on her. But the crowd was so big he couldn't get there very fast and, and he, and suddenly he felt something touch him. He, it wasn't the per, perception. It was, it was something in his, in his being. Oh. <laughs> Jesus knows when you reach out to him. This woman reached out to him and, and, and in her mind, she said, if I can just touch his garment, I'll be healed too. She had faith. Verse 28 says, for, for she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. Now think of it. Jairus was saying, if you'll come and lay hands on my daughter, she will live. 
And on his way to the little girl, another woman comes up and, 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 and Jesus he sees her. Supernaturally, he sees her. He doesn't know who touched him. And they didn't really touch him. They just touched his, his clothes, his garment, his, a little bit of his robe. How would you even know the big crowd was there, that anybody had touched you, that anybody needed help? But she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. Only believe. Oh, my. Now, I want you to see what happens to these two people. They had different circumstances. One of them probably was very rich. He had his little girl. I mean, what did his wealth mean? The Bible says, what, what does it matter if you, you own the whole world but lose your very soul? This woman, I don't know what her uh, circumstances were either financially and all that. But, you know, it didn't matter. In either case, it didn't matter. One had a sick little daughter and one was sick herself. It, it says in verse 25, let me tell you about the, the condition of this woman. And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood, probably leukemia, some terrible disease of her bloodstream. Twelve years she had had it, says here, and had suffered many things of many physicians. And had spent all that she had. And was nothing better, but rather grew worse. The doctors took her money. She went from doctor to doctor. Doing, uh, getting this uh, procedure, that procedure. And, and, and nothing happened, nothing helped. You read about people in the newspaper all the time. They have leukemia, they have cancer, they have some horrible uh, disease and nothing works. Well, they hear about some clinic down in Mexico or over in Jamaica. Maybe they'll go there. Maybe they'll be saved if they go there. And they go and they spend more money and they have nothing from it. She was not bettered. She grew worse. But when she heard of Jesus, she came and touched his garment. I suppose this was her last chance. She spent all the, the money she had and, and, and nothing had happened. She was just sick. And of course, it was the last chance for the little girl too, as we shall soon see here. Verse 30 says, and Jesus, now he was on his way to see Jairus' daughter, right? But this woman intervened. And Jesus, immediately knowing him in himself that virtue had gone out of him, Turned him about in the press, that's the, uh, the crowd, and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude <laughs> thronging thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? You know, you see this crowd, and you ask them, Who touched you? Everybody's trying to touch you, I suppose they said. Everybody wants to touch you. I suppose some people were touching him saying, You know, he can make me rich. If I just touch him, the spirit he has in him will make me a rich man. I, I, I suppose other people said, well, maybe I'll touch him. And I'll, I'll find the, the, the girl of my dreams or the, the boy of my dreams. I don't know. But Jesus didn't stop for anybody but this woman. You wouldn't have thought he cared about her because, after all, she was going to be dead pretty quick anyway. Why? He had more influential people to see. Why? He had Jairus. Man, at least go to that guy's house. Forget about this woman. Go see Jairus' daughter. If he can do something there, man. Jairus probably, he might turn the whole synagogue around. Everybody might start believing in Jesus just because Jairus does. But you see, Jesus knew his future. He knew Jairus wasn't going to turn around people. He could see. What was going to be happening to him? He was going to be crucified. He was going to be spit upon and mocked and, 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 and suffer on the cross. No matter what he did for Jairus, daughter, or this woman, or anybody. Why? His life was futile. What, what, what could he do? 
to save himself. He couldn't even, you know, they said on the cross, the people mocked him and they said to him when he was on the cross and serving, they said, well, you've saved others. Why don't you save yourself? He couldn't even save himself. That's what they said about him. And he looked around, verse 32 says, about to see her that had done done this thing. He looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, verse 33 says, but the woman fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. (laughs) Told him all the truth. The woman already knew something had happened inside her. Before uh, Jesus hadn't said a word. She touched his garment and she had been healed and was whole and <laughs> she was, she was gonna live and, and, and she felt healthy and, and alive and vibrant. She knew what had happened in her already. And it was, it was too good. Okay. I, she was, <laughs> she was about to, I'm sure gonna do a little jig dance. She was gonna celebrate. I'm not, and I'm sort of reading into the Bible there. I shouldn't, but wouldn't you? If you'd just been healed and you'd been to every doctor in the country about it, and they all said, I'm sorry, nothing can heal you. Well, something did. Jesus did. And all she had to do was just touch a little, little bit of piece of his garment. Verse 34 says, and he said unto her, daughter, he called her his daughter. I didn't, he didn't even know the lady. Why did he call her daughter? Why didn't he say woman? What, he knew everything. Why didn't he call her by her name? Or why didn't he ask her her name? He called her daughter. Now this is a, this is a real relationship you have to understand about. If, if Jesus has just healed you of a, a dread disease, and you fall down at his feet and he says to you, son or daughter, that's pretty important, isn't it? You're, you're one with him. You become his family. How would you like to instantly become the family, the part of the family of Jesus? That's what my friend said. I, I pray to Jesus and nothing happens. He hates me. Hmm. Wow. But this woman, she just touched his garment and she was healed. And he said, daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. Well, (laughs) she was his daughter. She wasn't only healed. She had become the daughter of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's better than being healed, isn't it? She had eternal life. Now, things had occurred in her heart and mind that I cannot even fathom. Well, I can because they happened to me back many years ago when I was uh, about 17 or 16 years old when I came to know Jesus. Same thing happened to me. I became his son. I had a new life. But verse 35 says, while he yet spake, There came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain. In other words, some people came. Members of the synagogue's house. Which said, Thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? Wow. Jairus was walking with Jesus to his house. But this woman intervened. There there was no time, was there? There's no time his daughter was dying. And then these people came up and said, Jairus, sir, your daughter's already dead. You don't need to trouble the, the master. You don't, you, the, the rabbi anymore, Jesus anymore. He can't do a thing for her now. It's too late. 36 says, as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid. Only believe. Hmm. 
he knew that knowing that his daughter was dead, they told him, they'd just come to him, your daughter is dead. Don't bother Jesus anymore. He needn't come now, it's too late. It struck fear in him. I'm telling you, friends, when you have a loved one and, and they, 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 they die and you're hoping they'll live and you're, 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 oh, it's such a tragic event. It's so, it's so hard to accept. Those of you who have lost loved ones, I know how you feel. It's tough. Jesus knew that. He, he knew what the, what Jairus felt like. So he said, don't be afraid. Only believe. Don't be fearful. Only believe. Hmm. Cast out your fear. Only believe. Now, folks, whatever your circumstance is, if you're a son or a daughter of Jesus Christ, if you believe in him, then believe that he can take you out of those circumstances, that he can heal you, that he can heal your loved one, that he can put your marriage back together, that he can give you a better job, that he can do anything for you that you need. Jesus didn't come to this world so you you could be poor. and I mean, <laughs> you might be poor, but you can even do God's will even then. Be happy even with being poor. He, but, but, but that's not why he came. He would love for you to be prosperous and succeed. And he suffered, verse 37, and he suffered no man to follow him except save Peter and James and John, the brother of James. So he told, okay, he said, I'm going to go to the house of Jairus. And he asked Peter and James and John to go with him. He didn't want the whole crowd. He just asked for those three. And he cometh to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and seeth the tumult and them that wept and wailed greatly. Boy, they were wailing. They were crying. He got to the house and he saw that. And, and I'm sure that Jairus was broken hearted. He was, he wanted to do what Jesus said and he was doing it. He, he believed. But I'm sure fear tried to come in. The fear that his daughter would never wake up. She was dead. She was gone. That, that fear must have tried to grip him. But Jesus had told him, only believe. And there they were. And everything was tumultuous and, I mean, chaotic. And people were crying and wailing. The girl had just died. Verse 39 says, And when he was coming, when Jesus came in, he said unto them, Why make you this ado? And weep. The, the damsel is not dead, but sleeps. Sleepeth. Why are you making such a big deal out of this? He said. <laughs> this, this little girl, she's not dead. She's only sleeping. I think about that. The atheist would say, well, she's dead. Her body's gonna, is going, I mean, it's already rotten. Give it time, it'll go back to the earth or the dust the way it was. We all will, and when you won't, you won't wake up. You're, you're not going to live on. There's not going to be an eternal life or any kind of life anywhere. You're just, you're just dirt. You're, you turn, return to dust. But Jesus said here, this, this girl was not dead, although she appeared to be, but she was only sleeping. Verse 40 says, and they laughed him to scorn. <laughs> Well, we're going to find out what happens on the other side here when we return. But think about it. They laughed him to scorn. They've never heard of such a thing. They've never seen such a thing. And here he was saying, why are you making such a big deal out of this? The girl's not dead. She's just sleeping. They knew. Who does he think he is? He's not a doctor. He's not. <laughs> he doesn't know. Of course she's dead. They laughed at him. Laughed him to scorn. We'll continue on the other side. This is Tech Smarts. You're listening to Power of Prophecy. Be right back. Hello, dear friends. This is Tech Smarts again. I'm so glad that you're listening to our program. We're talking about the subject of belief. 
only believe, said Jesus. What words? Think about it. Only believe. You know, Jesus can say more in two words than I can say in a, a whole book. <laughs> it's just, it's an astonishing thing, isn't it? I'm so glad you're listening to in this program, and I hope you'll listen each week here on Power of Prophecy. And I hope you'll listen to Bible Home Church. Bible Home Church, we have that on the Internet. And I preach a 30-minute talk every week there. You can uh, find out about it by going to BibleHomeChurch.org, BibleHomeChurch.org, and you can find out what's this week's message. In fact, we have an archive of all the messages I've, I've taught there, and they're absolutely free. BibleHomeChurch.org to listen to Christian messages of faith and truth and hope. And, of course, you can get this tape by sending $10, and please add $5 shipping and handling, $15. As for the audio tape or the CD, please specify, as for only believe, okay? You can get it in CD or audio tape, and we'll be glad to send this to you. Now, I want to thank those of you who give freely to this ministry. We couldn't exist without you. And very frankly, we love the, the gifts you give because they keep us, they, well, they just keep us alive here on earth. That is, <laughs> we're, we're continuing to do the will of God. And by joining us, by helping us with your love gifts, your offerings, you're helping this word of God go throughout the world. I want to assure you of one thing with power of prophecy and text Morris. The message that we have given for 30 years is the same. We have not changed. We certainly have gotten grown a little bit older, but we still have the same message and the assurance that God is love and God cares for you. And if you believe in him, he will save you. And you know, that's our message and by the way, this message goes out to Jews and Gentiles. It goes out to the Mexicans and the Brazilians and the Japanese. And of course, here in America, we don't have any race that we favor. Of course, some believe we're haters or something because, well, I don't know. I guess we're politically incorrect. Why are we politically incorrect? Because we preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that always is that, that, that ever since Jesus came, that's been politically incorrect. Even before they had the, the, the meaning of the words politically incorrect, Jesus was. He will always be incorrect as far as the world is concerned. And that makes us incorrect too. But we don't hate anybody, but we tell the truth. If you're a truth teller, we want you to join us. We want you to join us. I'd love to hear from you and say to me, Tex, I want to join you. I want to be a truth teller. I, I, I want to know the things that you're talking about. And if you want to know about Jesus, write us too. We'll pray for you. Now, our address to send love gifts or to get this tape today, the CD, our address is Power of Prophecy, 1708 Patterson Road, that's 1708 Patterson, P-A-T-T-E-R-S-O-N Road, Austin, Texas, 78733. That's, again, Power of Prophecy, or you can just write to me, Tex Mars, 1708 Patterson Road, Austin, Texas, 78733. If you want to know more about our ministry, go to powerofprophecy.com, powerofprophecy.com. There'll even be a picture of me. You might like what I look like, but it doesn't really matter. I have my wife there, and I have my little dog with me. And maybe you'll like my dog more than me. <laughs> Some people say, well, you're not the most handsome, but I like your little dog. Well, okay. <laughs> I like that dog, too. I've got two little dogs. I think pretty soon I'll be changing the picture 
and show you the other dog too. And of course, my beautiful wife, Wanda, is there. Maybe you'll like what she looks like. But you know, really, you shouldn't judge based on what a person looks like. It's of the heart, isn't it? It's of the heart. It's of the truth. Our phone number, I want to tell you about that, of course, is 1-800-234-9673. That's, of course, free to you. 1-800-234-9673. All right. Let's return now to a regular message. We're talking about belief. We're talking about when Jesus said, only believe. And we're right at the point when Jesus, when Jesus walked in to the home of Jairus, and there people were really upset because Jairus' daughter was, was, was dead. She was, she had passed away. And it says here, they laughed him to scorn. But when he had put them all out, he taketh the father and the mother of the damsel and them that were with him and entered in where the damsel was lying. So they laughed at him, but he told him, go outside, get out, <laughs> move out. You don't believe? Well, but remember, he had, he had, the, the father had believed. Remember that? The father went to Jesus. The father says, my daughter will live if you put your, your hands on her. He believed. So Jesus, the others were mocking. He said, well, go outside. Leave us alone. But he stayed with the mother and the father. Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue. And of course, he had three of the disciples with him. And they went in where she was lying. In repose. Dead. That's what they said. <laughs> 41. And he took the damsel, that's a little girl, by the hand and said unto her, Talithi Kumi. Which is, the verse says here, being interpreted, damsel, I say unto thee, arise. He took her hand. She was supposedly dead. And he said, young girl, I am telling you to raise up, to rise up. <laughs> and straightway the damsel arose and walked. For she was of the age of 12 years, and they were astonished with a great astonishment. Don't you know they were surprised? <laughs> and this girl obviously was healed of her affliction. She was a 12-year-old girl, and she was probably happy as a lark. She got up probably smiling, looked at them, and don't you know they were happy? <laughs> and he charged them straightly that no man should know it and commanded that something should be given her to eat. Now, why didn't he want anybody to know it? He wasn't trying to get credit. The ruler of, of, of the synagogue, he should have said, now you go out and tell the, the you go out and tell all the, the synagogue and the Sanhedrin, so I, I, I won't be crucified, so I, I'll be saved. That, you know, I don't want them to crucify me, so you go out and tell them. Tell everybody you know. Jesus said, don't tell anybody what happened here. But you know, my friends, <laughs> think about it. Think about it. Those who have ears and eyes to see and hear would have known about it. How about the crowd that he sent out uh, outside that were lamenting the death? And suddenly the little girl, okay, I'm, I'm sure she went outside to see them and said, hey, I'm okay. <laughs> they knew then. They knew. But there's no record of what they did. I don't think they did anything. I don't think anything happened to them. But the Bible says over and over that the gospel and the things of Jesus are for those who have eyes to see and ears that hear. Not everybody does. Not everybody knows about this. Not everybody wants to see, but they could have seen. The little girl was dead, they said, but now she's alive. But they probably began to talk to each other and say, oh, she wasn't dead. She was just sleeping. We made a mistake. You know, sometimes the breath is so light that the doctors say, well, you know, they're gone. She, they, they, the doctor made a mistake. That's all. Hmm. Now, friends, this verse has a lot of meaning. 
There's the healing, of course. Jesus is the great healer, isn't he? <laughs> he really is. He will heal you. He can heal. He heals in every generation. And those pastors who said to, who say to you now, well, Jesus used to heal, but there's no healing now. That was a miracle that happened back then. That's pretty silly. Jesus can heal in every generation. And he heals he healed in the Old Testament. You can go there and find out uh, in the several accounts of, of healing. And here he raised somebody from the dead. You can read about Lazarus, too, being raised from the dead. And he healed. Jesus is alive today. He's alive, and he'll do whatever he wants to do. And if you ask him to do it for you, he will hear you. Ask, and you shall receive. That's what Jesus said. Ask, and you'll receive. He didn't say, ask, and I, I'm probably going to be busy, and there are going to be other people you know, pushing at me, trying to touch me and trying to get me to pay attention to them. I'm probably not going to be able to, to tend to your problem, but I might. So you, you, you just pray and ask and, and maybe it'll happen. No, he didn't say that. He said, ask and you'll receive. And the Bible tells us that, that people don't receive because they don't ask. That's pretty simple, isn't it? You receive not because you ask not. Well, you know, it's been my experience, my friends, that when I don't pray for something, I usually don't get it. When I don't pray for something, I usually don't get it. I was telling you last week about going in to a, a, a New Age occult bookstore to to do some research, and I didn't pray. I hadn't prayed, you know, for several hours, and I just pulled my car up in the parking lot and went right in there. And I'm telling you, my friends, I had no sooner got in there and, and began to read the material in that huge, huge, it was the largest New Age occult bookstore in the world. And I began to read, um, I think it was a book or it might have been a magazine. I can't remember now. But I'll tell you one thing. I felt like I was being oppressed. I mean, I felt a demon trying to enter my body. But he didn't. he didn't make it. Because I prayed. I knew I'd made a mistake. See, that, I make so many mistakes when I don't pray. And when somebody asks me, please pray for me, I will pray for them. Why? I know how important it is. I know it will change things. Now, the world is made the way it is. It's, it's a material thing. I mean, I, I've learned all about quantum physics and all this. I realize the world is a material, of a material substance. But it, but it also, the, the, the world is made up of things that you cannot see that are invisible. We don't even know about these things. You, you look out your window and you see a tree. Maybe it's a hundred feet away from you. But did you know that there are many things, probably millions of items of things, all kinds of life and substances that you can't even see between you and the tree. And things are going to happen and it's not that your mind makes it happen. That's magic. That's that's the, what the magicians and the devils do. They tell you, think, and it'll arrive to you. Believe, and it'll come to you. What are you believing in? Well, I believe I'll have a million dollars, so I'm going to have a million dollars. Okay. It might happen, might not. I have found, though, friends, when people pray for the wrong things, they get the wrong things. Had a young lady one time told me, if, if I'm going to pray because I want this boy to be my husband. I'm just sure he's going to be my husband. Now, the boy was a, he was a pretty bad boy. He was a drug user, been in and out of reform schools. This was a young Christian girl, and she just knew the boy was for her. But something in my heart told me that he wasn't for her. And I said to her, well, I don't believe God is going to let you have this boy. Because you're a Christian. Oh, yes, he must because I want him. Oh, really? <laughs> There's such things, you know, as unanswered prayers. Unanswered. God knows what's good for you. He may not give you the things that will harm you. Now, some doctors will. They, 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 they read the brochure from the pharmaceutical company. They'll say, this will heal this, this woman or this man of this affliction, this, this, this sickness. And they give you a, a certain pill 
or certain compound, but it doesn't work, it, you get worse. But God doesn't do that. You ask of him and he knows your needs. In fact, he already knows before you've ever asked. And the Bible says God inhabits the prayers of the saints. I want to repeat that. God inhabits the prayers of the saints. Now, let me tell you how this works. (laughs) This is an amazing thing. An amazing thing. Did you know that when you pray... Something entirely supernatural occurs. Your prayer becomes, it becomes something un, unreal to you. It's, it's, it's an invisible, a, a power. God is in that prayer that you're praying. He inhabits it. Now, do you know how much power that gives you, my friends? No matter what you've got against you, if you're in battle and you've got a, a hundred soldiers and they're, they're bearing down on you and you pray to God, that prayer, God enters the prayer. He is within the prayer. I don't know how he does it. I don't know how the, the Holy Spirit works, too. It, you can't see it, but it's working. It accomplishes miracles. <laughs> he inhabits the prayers of the saints. And then they're not battling just you, those hundred other warriors or soldiers. They're battling your prayer and God within it. Now, I can't communicate well to you. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, I don't think anybody could, though. You know, I used to teach at the University of Texas, and there they were. I think there were like 2,000 professors there. I don't believe any of them would understand what I'm talking about. But I'm, I'm confident that many of you listening to me will understand exactly what I'm talking about. When Jesus heard Jairus say, just put your hands on my daughter and she will live. Do you realize how much power that pair gave to Jairus? And she was healed. And then, of course, there's the centurion. You know the story of the, 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 the Roman centurion. And the Jews all thought they were better than the Romans and they were better than the Samaritans and they were better than everybody. Their superior race. But this centurion went unto Jesus and he said, please, I'm a, I'm a, a, a commander of men and I've got a problem. He said, my servant is sick. The man cared for his servant. He loved his servant. Now, you know, if I'm an employer, I love my employees. I usually do, at least. (laughs) And I want to see them do well. I want to see them succeed. I'd like it if they, they did better in life than I do. And my children are the same way. I'd love for my children to, to get, have a better life than I had. I work so that my child can, can get ahead of me. You ever thought about that, friends? That's the way a, a person who loves someone, that will happen. And I've had, uh, you know, when I was a commanding officer in the Air Force, I had young men who worked for me, and I love these men. I'm talking about the love of, of a human being for each other. I'm not talking about sexual love. I'm not just love, just love, period. And when they did a good job, I was proud of them. And I would maybe maybe nominate them for some award, Airman of the Month or something. I would give them a good performance report so the promotion board would see this. I believe Jesus is just like that. (laughs) He's watching you all the time. He wants to see you advance. He wants to see you do better. He wants to see you succeed. He wants to see you happy. He wanted Jairus' daughter to be healed. He wanted this woman with this issue of blood, this problem with blood, this horrible disease, he wanted her to be made whole. The instant they prayed to him, it was going to be done. I've told you about the man in church, that everybody in the church was praying. They had an altar call. They don't even have altar calls in most churches nowadays. But they had an altar call there. And this man from the back, suddenly a voice came out. It rang out and he said, Lord, Lord, save me, a sinner. Some people would have been embarrassed. Wow, 
Don't say that. You're telling everybody you're a sinner. You're, you're the back of the church. Everybody's going to look around and see who you are. <laughs> but, but, but this man was, he was like Jairus who fell at Jesus' feet. He was like this woman who touched Jesus. He said, Lord, help me. Help me. There's a story in the Bible of a man like that that said, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. Do you think Jesus did that? Do you think Jesus saved that man? Think about it. He said, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. He wanted to believe even more. He was saying, give me more faith. Give me more to believe. Now, I know these faith preachers, these word of faith preachers, say, you got to have faith. If you have faith, you, you don't even need Jesus. You can command it yourself. Really? Not true. But here this man said, I believe, help thou my unbelief. I believe Jesus did. I think that man, <laughs> by the time everything was over, he had more belief than anybody else you can imagine. He was full of belief. He was full of faith. Why? He asked for it. What do you need today? Have you asked for it? God wants you to ask for his help. He knows of your needs already, but he, he would like you to ask. I mean, he's your father, and he would like you to ask for it. Now, you can be strong and stubborn and say, I could do things for myself. I don't need you, God. I don't need you, my father. I, 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 I can make it. I, I'm, I got a college degree. I, I can do good. I can get this job. I can compete. I, I can go see the doctors. I can get well. Okay. Okay. Jesus just might let you do it on your own. And maybe you'll make it. And maybe you won't. Because I'm telling you, friends, this world has more things against you than you have for yourself. But the Bible says, greater is he, he that is in you than he that is in the world. Now, the devil's in the world. The devil owns this world. He's got everything against you. And you're like a lamb ready for slaughter. I'm going to get Sandra. I'm going to get uh, Jerry. I'm going to get Michelle. I'm going to get uh, Juan. I'm going to get th these people. I I've got them. But suddenly they confound him because they pray. Lord Jesus, help me. Lord Jesus, help me. And God inhabits their prayers. How can the devil defeat that? God is in somehow living in the prayers. You say, well, God can't live in prayers. Really? Oh, yes, he can. There's nothing that's material to God. <laughs> God could walk on the water. How did he stay up? <laughs> And, you know, the disciples started to walk on the water, and, boy, he believed because he had just seen the Lord do it. And I, well, I, I can, I, I've got faith, and he started doing it. Then he lost his faith, went on, started doubting. Went right down, didn't he? <laughs> That's a good way to get drowned. Don't step out of the water. Expect to walk unless you have faith. Only believe. You know, if somebody has a problem and they don't believe God can do it, I say, you know, I'm going to give them some Instruction. I used to be a professor for many years. Let me just get you a piece of paper and some pencil and just write 500 times, only believe. <laughs> write, write it down. Only believe, only believe, only believe. <laughs> no, don't do that. You could. Maybe that would help you to believe a little bit better. The best way, though, is to read the Bible. Oh, there are many stories like the ones I've given you here. How about when, when, when Paul... Uh, and, and, and some other disciples were, were thrown in a jail. And, and there they were in jail. They were going to see the, 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 the judges the next day. They were in jail, but then an earthquake came. Who sent that earthquake? And the jail was torn down. But they just sat there praying and thanking God. For an earthquake, I suppose. And the jailer came in and said, boy, I just knew they were going to escape and I was going to get blamed for them getting out. And they were going to get me. I'm going to lose my neck because Paul would be freed 
from the earthquake. And you know, the normal prisoner, what would he have done? Of course, the earthquake comes, he's gone. He's escaped. Man, he's moving out. But Paul just sat there. <laughs> and the jailer came in. And let me tell you what he, what he asked. Then he called for a light, it says here in Acts chapter 17. Now, let me read verse 28. I love this one. He supposed that the prisoners had fled. Verse 28 says, But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Cyrus and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Why did he say that? He could have said, well, thank you for staying. Now I'm going to take you to see the judge later. And you'll meet justice. It had been hard, hard. Or he could have said, well, I'm going to tell the judge some good things about you. That you didn't try to escape when the earthquake had happened. Instead, he knew. He knew these men were saved. What does that mean? They were born again and, 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 and he wanted to be like them. He knew something supernatural had happened. Something great had happened here. And he said to them, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What jailer has said that in your hometown? You know of any prison that the jailer asked the prisoner, What can I do to be saved? I suspect there are a few. Maybe. And they said, that is Paul, and the other disciples, and they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And they spoke unto him, or spake unto him, the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his straightway. His stripes. He had been beaten. They had been beaten. They weren't just thrown in a cell. They had been beaten. He washed their stripes. He cared for them. The jailer cared for the prisoners. He took them out of the, the, the jailhouse and he cared for them. And he and his whole family were saved. Would you like to see your family saved? Would you like to see your wife or your husband? Well, what can, what can you do? You can be saved. And Jesus said that I'll save your whole house. My goodness, what a promise that is. Hmm. That goes on to say that the next day the magistrates let Paul go. And they didn't have a trial, they just let him go. And there's reasons why, and you can read that there at Acts. But here's what I want to tell you, my friends. You must believe. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe that he is who he said he was. Believe that he can do whatever he said he would do. And it will be done for you. <laughs> It'll be done for you. you. You'll be shocked. You won't be calling Tex Morris and saying, God hates me. You won't believe that at all. You'll say, God loves me. And I love him. And my whole life has changed because I listen to Jesus Christ when he said in his word, only believe. My friends, this has been power of prophecy. It's been great being with you today as we went through the word of God and saw the power of Jesus, the might of the Lord and the faith of his people. My prayer is you'll listen each week during the same time here on Power of Prophecy and discover the power that is in Bible prophecy.